So thank you so much for joining us for this session. You are in notes from an epic course design journey. My name is Megan Raymond, and I direct programs, sponsorship, and membership here at WCET. And I'm thrilled that we have an excellent panel today. So thanks for hanging in there. I know for some of you, it's a, a late afternoon, late evening. As we go through, feel free to enter any questions into the chat, either in Feedloop or in Zoom. And it's helpful if you indicate your question by putting the actual question mark symbol ahead of it so that we can keep track. But we'll go ahead and get started. So please welcome Kate Parker. Thanks so much, Megan, and, and thanks so much for joining everyone. We know it's been an epic day, so welcome to the epic course design journey. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And, and as Megan indicated, we're really looking to make this an interactive session. So um, we'll be including some polling questions throughout. We'll kick one off just in a minute. Um, and then I'll be monitoring the chat to see, if, you know, bring in your questions and comments as we go through the discussion. And we'll be sure to try and leave some time at the end for Q&A. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Kate Parker. I'm the Vice President of Content Services at Learning Me, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Frank Tomsick, Dean of Broward College Online and Interim District Director for Instructional Design, and my colleagues from Learning Me, Nick Carbone, Director of Learning Design, and Lynn Cohen, Director of Strategic Accounts. Almost exactly a year ago today, Learning Mate joined Broward College on an epic course design journey. We'll be giving you a sense of that journey today in the hopes that our insights will fuel your progress in course design. So let's get started with that very first polling question. We'd love to know, what are you most interested in learning about today? Maintaining the quality of Oops, my little poll guy just popped up in front. Maintaining quality of courses at scale, increasing student engagement, applying principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or other. So we'll give you a minute. Fantastic. All right. Well, this is great. I think that we'll be touching on lots of things that we've got. Um, Half of you are interested in increasing student engagement, which was a huge part of this initiative, applying principles of DEI and maintaining quality of courses at scale. So um, this is great. You're in the right place. I hope that this will be a fruitful uh, session for all of you. And um, with that, I will kick it over to Dean Tomsick. Frank. Thank you, Kate. And thank you everyone for taking the time to visit with us today. Uh, it has been an epic journey. And so it's interesting to uh, see the uh, results of the poll indicating that you want to see how we and our work have increased student engagement, which I think Nick and Lynn can talk to a little bit later, um, as well as, most appropriately for me, how we are maintaining qu uh, course quality at scale. So I'll give you some background. During the early weeks of the pandemic, uh, our face-to-face -face learning operations were completely stalled, as I'm sure happened to your colleges. Uh, and our college shifted to our temporary emergency response we called remote learning. The college quickly realized that the impacts to academic integrity and quality and continuity on our traditional modalities did not occur with uh, our online campus. We didn't have any of those interruptions. So we began working on how we might mitigate those remote learning risks while improving overall academic quality and equity. We determined to leverage the carefully designed and developed learning experiences that had been previously used for all of our online courses to support our remote learning experience. The timing worked out as a result of receiving some COVID uh, funding. Uh, and that uh, COVID, uh, I'm sure you all got it, but it's uh, CARES stands for COVID Virus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. And its rationale was to cover any costs associated with significant changes to the delivery uh, of instruction due to the coronavirus. So our intentions and vision for uh, this expansive road trip became to use those CARES funding to increase the number of courses that would include high quality teaching interventions using universal design for learning, one of those ways of uh, increasing student engagement, the community of inquiry framework, which includes student to student, student to content, and student to faculty engagements, as well as guidance for diversity and inclusion. And interestingly, as a side note, the systematic use of curriculum maps. 
Interestingly, the relatively mundane concept of curriculum mapping became increasingly salient in our academic continuity plan as they acted as a roadmap to ensure that the designed intentions could be systematically extended to new faculty and new modalities. Uh, the pedagogical improvements further included subtle shifts towards student-centered and authentic learning that would support consistency, equity, and inclusivity for our diverse community of learners. By extending the reach of our consistently well-designed and developed learning experiences, traditionally invested in online for other modalities, the college expects to see an improved resilience and enrollment across modalities, regardless of future uh, environmental risks, uh, improved student success, retention, and graduation rates. Uh, we can move to the next slide. And then if we could post the poll question. Frank, it looks like you're on mute. There you go. Sorry. Let's move on to the next slide. It looks like the most uh, interesting one for folks is the increased interactive learning activities. So this uh, slide just shows some of the achievements from the project, our first destination for which the college began the journey of transformation by creating the plan and preparing our courses as vehicles of change. But this is not our final destination. And if we move on to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about where we're going with the journey. So to answer our why take the journey, why go there, I have to note that Broward College exists to transform students' lives and enrich our diverse community through academic excellence, innovation, and meaningful career opportunities. What better way to support this mission than to face the adversity of the pandemic and transform from it into a resilient, excellent and positive student impactful uh, experience across all modalities. So as I mentioned earlier, the first leg of the journey has been achieved. The majority of, of the courses designed under the CARES Act have been baseline for use in our fall 2021 uh, and 2022 spring uh, terms. And more importantly, our design and development standards, our rules for the road ahead have extended to our faculty development programming and will impact every future course, regardless of modality. We will continue to track student success to demonstrate the full impact of this journey. And we expect that impact to evolve for years to come. So Frank, what do you think are the most valuable persistent artifacts of this process? Yeah, you know, certainly the courses we produced are very impactful because as a result of that continuity planning, we plan on leveraging those courses against not only uh, our, our online campus, but for what we're now transforming into a synchronous online learning experience from our asynchronous modality for BC Online, as well as our blended courses and hopefully into our face-to-face uh, -face courses in the future. But more important for the enterprise and kind of speaking to the assurances of alignment and quality in the long duration are the uh, standards documents that we worked to produce together. We not only use them in the instructional design and development team, but we actually share them with faculty. So they know the why behind the what of our journey. And we've embedded these uh, standards into our faculty development programming. Um, I have to put another note in for, of course, our curriculum mapping because not only are the faculty getting the standards around online teaching and learning and how to engage learners regardless of modality, the curriculum maps provide a course by course, turn by turn direction for how new faculty can operate the course as it was designed and developed. 
Thanks, Frank. I, I really appreciate your framing the, the why of our journey here today. Um, learning may join this effort to enable the how. And here to talk to us about this how is Nick Carbone. Nick? Thank you, Kate. Um, the, uh, before we jump into the polling question, I just want to put some things into context about the size that was on one of Frank's slides. Uh, again, this was 300 courses with close to uh, 200 faculty involved. Um, each faculty had the option to create five to seven uh, interactive media pieces. Um, they were all focusing on community of inquiry to increase student to student engagement and student to faculty engagement in particular. So it was a, a, just a big project that we did in 10 months. Um, and if you were thinking about that kind of project, uh, the, the polling question that we're going to put up now is what might be your biggest planning challenge just for yourselves um, with, at whatever institution you're at and what, what, what would you want to be thinking about most and if one of the three choices doesn't fit anything um, feel free to just add something into the chat. Okay, well, we got, um, yeah, I think the, the, the documentation is a huge part and, and that's related to the orientation. And interestingly enough, the documentation reflects any uh, definitions and alignment that go on because the documentation includes um, standards. Uh, Phoebe's got a, an, another in the uh, chat of helping faculty to stay on track and not get overwhelmed um, and that, that was a huge planning consideration. So if we go to the next slide, we'll pick up with uh, Phoebe's thought on the next slide. Um, part of what we had to do when you have a destination was practice good learning design for the project. And good project design, like good learning design, uh, involves some you know, backwards design. So we, we knew where Frank and the RFP wanted to go with increased engagement. Um, we also knew that there were other variables. Um, so when we looked at Broward and the faculty and uh, what was going on, if you go to the next slide, you'll see what some of the things that we were starting with. Um, when you, and the, the, the metaphor, we're switching road metaphors now, the Oregon Trail. Um, I don't remember if you guys remember the old game on the CD-ROM where you're, you're going on the trail and you had to make decisions about what you could carry because you had a wagon and you made decisions about how much flour, how many bullets, uh, how many other provisions, and you're, you, they were variables on the journey. This project was full of those variables. So you had 195 faculty or so, all with different levels of experience in instructional design. Um, at Broward, um, they were doing course maps, and this was the first time most of the faculty had created a formal course map, so it was a new skill. Um, for faculty who did interactive media, uh, for many of them, it was the first time they ever designed interactive media. Um, so there were two really new things for faculty. Um, experience varied, um, familiarity with tools varied. Um, we were trying to do things in Google Docs that made accommodations for Word because of different systems. And then we were doing this in the middle of an academic year. We started in November and we finished, um, we targeted the end of May, but we went into the end of June. Um, there was a pandemic that was known. Uh, we also knew that faculty had five, five teaching modes. Most faculty who took on uh, coursework did it in addition instead of a course buyout. Um, then there was things that we didn't know um, that we were in the middle of the project and we had freelancers working out of Texas who were offline for two weeks because of the snowstorm. Um, the Delta surge affected everybody from India first and then um, later on into the US. So it was um, sort of an epic journey in many ways. And what we designed for in the beginning was accommodating all those variables. So if we look at the next slide, um, we came up with some systems that we, we partnered with liaisons who are pathway heads, uh, department heads for different departments, they're called pathways, of figuring out what's going to best work for faculty. One of the first things we hit on was small changes when we took the small teaching book from Lang and then uh, uh, Flower Darby and Lang small teaching online 
and use that as a model because the premise there is you can make significant impacts as a faculty member without redesigning a course from top to bottom just by making some small changes. Um, so we focused on what the work in a course was going to be first and then moving out to how you create a system of support for 300 of those courses. So we did the course map. The course mapping was a process of teaching faculty how to do the course maps, but the course map helped them think through the course and develop um, a course plan. And what we meant by course plan was a way of putting into a smart sheet what they were going to do in their courses. And remember, they were all making different decisions um, and capturing that in a smart sheet so that those smart sheets would roll up into uh, larger reports for tracking. Um, and then the other thing we leaned into was templates. And that goes back to the documentation and guidelines that was a big part of the poll we created not only documentation, but templates, examples of how to use the templates. Um, as the project went on and work resulted directly from the project, the examples switched to project-based template uh, examples. If you go to the next slide, you'll see how this transitioned into the larger project. Um, because we had 300 courses and we were working in an academic year, we tried to work on a 50-day calendar where 40 of the, of the 50 days or for working for, with faculty. So when the faculty worked on their course map and decided what they wanted to create in the course, what they wanted to revise, what they were gonna leave the same, it went into a smart sheet that was measured out in sessions. And they were just simple sessions of, of five working calendar days each. And that helped faculty organize the work, not get overwhelmed by it, gave us flexibility for them to make their individual choices as faculty members but also keeping to common standards and common guidelines and common timeframes. Um, if you go to the next slide, we'll look at just one example of how this played out using a combination of templates. So again, faculty hadn't done interactive media. Um, they were asked to do scenario-based media first, but if they couldn't come up with a scenario, any kind of uh, threshold teaching concept. And so we narrowed it down so that all faculty really had to think about to start was just a narrative. What's, what's the scenario? What's the issue to be taught? And they wrote a simple script and a simple table um, with their own ideas for art. Um, we had a document that showed them what the process was going to be. So they wrote the script. Um, then they were back and forth with uh, articulate templates. And you see in these templates, we had set character sets that uh, were representative of our DEI uh, initiative that was part of the project. They were things they couldn't do in articulate, but there were things they could do. And we limited it to articulate uses that we knew were ADA compliant. So there was no drag and drop, for example. But by limiting what they could do and giving them a template that freed up creativity because it takes things off your plate freeze your cognitive bandwidth to focus on what happens. And then they would turn this stuff over. And if you go to the next slide, after they did the script, Learning Mate then carried out the process. We had visual designers lay out the work and articulate. Um, faculty saw a storyboard. Um, we created the interactive pieces. So every articulate had an auto-scored question that reported back um, into a SCORM uh, integration with D2L. Um, so that the interactivity was captured and became part of the course. So that's just one example of applying all those different principles in a large scale project. Um, with that, um, we can turn it over to, to Lynn. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I just, before we hop to Lynn, I, I just wanted to throw it out to the, those folks of you in the audience, if you have any questions, um, please, please pop them into the chat. I hope that may, maybe gave, shed some light on, on the, um, considerations that we were talking about in the polling question at the beginning of the section. Um, Nick, I love how you took the challenge of developing so many courses over such a short period of time and broke it down into actionable opportunities for small, meaningful changes that faculty could use to transform their courses. Frank, I'm curious from your point of view, if you had to cite one change that will have a lasting impact for Broward College, what do you think it would be? I wish I could cite merely one, Kate. Uh, certainly, as we've discussed, the curriculum maps are impactful uh, to help faculty to use the courses as designed and developed. And then certainly the project planning and the uh, standards document that we developed together are going to transformation, transform 
how we interact with faculty to support them and, and keep them on track and make sure they don't get overwhelmed. But I think for our students and our consciousness overall as an institution really has been the notions of universal design for learning as well as the diversity, inclusion, and equity, because it was starting with that equity across the modalities, leveraging the work that we've previously done online, that we've seen a lot of impact. And now we're not just walking the equity walk, I'm sorry, we're not just talking the equity talk, we're walking the equity walk, and we're using the language of equity in all that we do. So I, I look at those various components as being absolutely uh, transformational ongoing. Yeah, I, I'm really proud of what we were able to achieve together there, Frank, because I think that Broward has such a profound commitment to the community that Broward College serves and um, and the being able to sort of give you a set of tools to help you, you know, action out some of those great ideas around diversity, equity, and inclusion, including some guidelines and standards documentation, as well as some rubrics for course evaluation. That's something um, that is really, really um, uh, was, you know, it made it real, you know, really, uh, I think it really, and it, and I can see throughout the courses that we worked on together, I see that that really exemplified there. And I, I'm really, I'm really proud of that. Um, we've got um, a question in the chat here, Rondi, and I think that this was going back to something that, that um, Nick was talking about too, is how do we go about training the faculty on all the needed tech tools? And, and what about accessibility training and for document creation? Um, and, and Nick, you're, you're answering here in the chat, but perhaps this might be of interest to others too. Yeah, so we, we didn't, we, we didn't have, faculty did not have to learn articulate. Um, if, if they wanted to, they were welcome to. We really focused them on um, understanding how the, we had an articulate deck of templates, what the templates allowed, you know, so an image left, text right, um, a video embed, um, different kinds of navigation. Um, so they, they had a sense of how, how their, their content would look and display, but really try to focus the, them on the content you know, helping them get to um, a good word length, helping them write um, good um, multiple choice questions if that's what they chose with common distractors, um, and then doing the storyboarding. And then once they got the storyboards, they had a little bit better sense of what it was going to look like. And so the storyboard feedback became an important stage. So the goal was to let them focus on what faculty knew best. They, they knew the concepts, they knew the, the, the scenarios. Um, and then participate in the creation, but without being responsible for the heavy lifting. It was similar with accessibility. We, we, we kept accessibility um, to three or four simple things that we asked faculty and IDs to do with anything they created or revised. With older stuff, we just had a learning mate person fix it. Um, so, you know, how to write good relative links, not using long URLs, um, uh, how to uh, tag uh, images um, with, with all text and um, a little bit of um, layout design and, and color. So we kept the, the ADA stuff simple, but try to show that, you know, this, this is stuff that they can do natively if they make it a habit. Um, if, you, if you tag something with an H1 tag um, versus using a visual design, it works. And so it was low hanging fruit, um, a little bit of repetition and then guidelines and examples. Yeah. And I also would like to add that we did um, check accessibility um, of all of the files and run through our accessibility guidelines and, and checkers. So, uh, you know, we asked the faculty and our instructional designers to adhere to some low hanging fruit, as Nick said, but then we also checked because our goal is to be, um, you know, as close to 100% accessibility at the end with all of the content that we could. That's great. And what a great segue, Lynn, to, to your taking us through where the rubber meets the road here. Take it away. All right. I hope you guys are not sick of our on the road and now our road analogy yet. Um, we're going to start with a polling question. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, execution of the project. So um, as far as logistics, what do you think would be your biggest logistical challenge if you took on, um, you know, a course design project of, of this scale? Let's see what everyone thinks. 
So we talked a lot about documentation, you know, having documentation in the beginning to really put up those, uh, you know, guidelines and, and rules of the road, if you will, is, is a, a tough hurdle. Then tracking all of that uh, courses and reporting on it, and then also expanding and managing the staff, you know, the sheer multitude of people, roles and volume of people you need to get all of this done is pretty overwhelming. Okay, so it looks like staff is coming in <laughs> as the number one so far, but you know, of course, all of all of these are pretty important. Thank you. So um, Megan, we'll just uh, go to the next one if you don't mind. Okay. Let's see, there's a little delay, got it. So here on this slide, um, you know, it's a slide that's, a, you know, meant to be a little overwhelming. We executed as a, at an unprecedented scale. We had, I think like exactly 308 courses in approximately eight months with over 500 people. With this scale, you really have to plan your team carefully to handle the volume and also be able to absorb and act upon lessons learned that you learn amongst your team and also with Broward, with our, our feedback coming from all the folks at Broward during the review process. Um, the first, first row is the, the Broward team members. The middle row is our learning mate team, again, totaling over four, 500 people. And the last row reflects uh, numbers on the work that we did together. So um, through the course of uh, execution, we were trying to figure out what's the best way to, to deal with all of these courses. So, you know, you always have to create smaller teams within your big program. So we, uh, we recommend, you know, you create teams that make sense, some natural division in the product. product. So here we had course disciplines or it could be departments in this project, as Nick had mentioned before, um, the disciplines were called pathways. So there was 11 and we built teams around those pathways with a project manager at the you know, center as the hub of the wheel. Um, we needed to cluster into groups so you would continually work together, get to know the way you work, share ideas, develop relationships. But we also wanted to make sure that we created mechanisms for sharing best practices and make sure there's oversight between all of those teams. Um, no team could really work in a bubble, you know, because then you can't get all those lessons learned and sharing of good practices. So we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, ensured consistency, quality, and efficiency. Okay, next slide, please. And of course, put. Um, I'm not seeing the chat, so Kate, feel free to jump in if there's anything there. Um, Okay, so in order to handle the large volume with a new workflow, you really have to start small before getting into that cruising speed. My analogy, I had fun picking out some graphics here. <laughs> um, first, I think in every project, you wanna start with a few items, a few courses in a pilot group. So workflow, you could you know, hone your workflow, figure out what works, what doesn't, gather feedback and apply the feedback. Um, we worked with, you know, tried to schedule a pilot with, with um, highly engaged team members, if you can, you know, which makes the most sense, have people volunteer courses or whatever it may be, um, and get, get a pilot going and then move up to ramp, ramp up time, um, then, then start cruising along for your peak performance, um, improve quality as you go along, refine your acceptance criteria and your workflow. Um, we always, always, always want to skip or rush this pilot phase. So one of the main takeaways that we wanted to share with you all is that if you do that, you're gonna regret. <laughs> you're gonna regret it. Um, you know, when you skip, you you just can't really. You know, you can never get into that backtrack phase, and you're always fixing as you're building. You know, everyone says build the plane as you're flying it as much as you can, and not do it. You know, that's that's the best that you could do. Um, and it's also very important that all stakeholders review the pilot deliverables so everyone's on, all on the same page. If people have different expectations and there's a mismatch, that's where you have problems too. And knowing what your acceptance criteria and everyone buying into that um, established across all the teams and all the deliverables to ensure quality across the program and expectations, um, you know, that's really important as well. I'll stop here. I see some chat questions. 
I think I think the one thing I just want to underscore, because I really don't think you can say it enough, that pilot phase is really, really important. And particularly as we were sort of talking earlier about buy-in and Phoebe raised that question in the chat earlier, um, getting those early adopters, finding your champions internally and finding the folks who are going to really help you, you know, persuade others to join in the effort. It, it's hard. It's a, it's a lot of change and people generally don't particularly like change. And so um, the more we can sort of, you know, really um, like sw swarm a, an early set of stuff, have everyone, all stakeholders on all sides really review it very carefully so that we can ensure that we're speaking the same language. I think, you know, we were up against time as a massive challenge given that certain constraints of this project, but I think everywhere where we possibly can, uh, really just making sure that we're able to um, work together, align on shared expectations, and, the, and then proceed from there. Um, so I think Lynn's right. People often like to skip over that step because they're like, oh, this seems fine. I'll look at it later. If you look at it later, it will have moved so far down the line that you'll you'll wind up regretting it. And I think, I don't know, Frank, you're nodding too. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to share. Yeah, it, I'd love to add to this, to Rondi's question. You know, we do have instructional design team members on staff at Broward College, but given the sheer number of courses, it is, it would have been, physically impossible for us to accomplish this uh, massive tour on our own. Um, even just preparing the documentation took so much of our design team's time, but the work has made us so much better. We've left no rock unturned as we now are aligning and understanding how we will all continue to produce the same high quality learning. Um, and that's where the role of the collaboration, the review process, and certainly prototyping came in handy for this project. There's also a question about clarification around 2000 hours of training. That training was about uh, training the teams to do this stuff and training the hundreds of people how to use all these templates and stuff, which you know aren't super complicated, but when you have that many people trying to learn it all like roughly at the same time, it, it's a lot of time. So it doesn't correlate um, to, to the, the course seat time or anything. This is just project related time. So there's also a, it's an investment uh, of your, in your team and so forth. So um, yeah, sorry if that was a little confusing. And if I could add one more plug that in full transparency, LearningMate was able to respond to this because in our initial RFP, we thought we were gonna have 200 courses to produce. So I think training probably started before we even executed. And then when we started, we said, hey, there's actually 308. So the additional investment and training that LearningMate provided to their colleagues, I think demonstrates uh, the intentionality that they have in providing value to their customer. Okay, thanks, Frank. All right, so um, again, there's my cars. So after the pilot, you know, you, as Kate was saying, you have time, you know, you're working against time and you kind of want to say, hey, I have 300 courses. I want to get going immediately, you know, but again, that pilot phase. So after the pilot phase, we divide it into batches of courses and kind of work a little bit in an iterative fashion. So course batches really start together. But what we learned um, as we started is that every course is its own car. You know, we have to track each one. And even though you want them to all start and kind of pace with each other, it, it never happens as you plan, you know? So even though they share a start time, a lot happens along the way that could detour you. So you have to have systems in place to track each one, each course and each step of the workflow. Next slide, please. Um, so throughout all projects, you, you know, especially of this scale, reporting on a detailed level via status report in weekly meetings is common. For this project, we use, um, you know, thinking about technology, we use Smartsheets and the Google Suite to track and report in real time. This, what you see on screen is a dashboard for one of the pathways, science, that gives a, you know, a quick dashboard view in real time of the project health 
um, and we worked with Broward to figure out, well, what does everybody want to see really quickly? And it was really like highlighting schedule and dependency risks. Like, is there faculty dependency? Are we waiting for art? What, you know, what is that dependency? Um, and, and highlighting these for key st stakeholders along the way. Um, and as you can imagine, throughout the project, you generate a lot of data. So, you know, I encourage you to just think about if I'm going to take on a project that this at this scale, you know, what would make the most sense and spend some time to really thoughtfully plan that out? You know, how can you report live in an automated fashion? Um, and then also later on, you're going to be asked, you know, or you may want to roll up data in ways you may never have thought of, you know, so making sure you have systems in place to be able to parse that data when you, when you need to. Wow, Lynn, you've taken us through a lot of the logistics of getting this, um, race started <laughs> Sorry, I've lost the race, race to the finish, finish. yeah <laughs> um, where the rubber met the road um but but uh in all seriousness what factor do you think was most critical to your success in in bringing all of these moving pieces together without a car crash yeah um there you know with over 500 people and 300 plus courses it's really like making sure you understand where everything is at any moment in time. You can't like lose track of a course or forget that you didn't do X, you know? So the project managers were very, you know, strategic in tracking all of that stuff um, and also keeping it updated in, in, in report to Broward. Um, you know, we had to be able to not have old news there and we couldn't lose track of any of these cars going on detours. So, um, you know, each course was, always at a you know different critical point and the and the project managers really had a um you know the expectation was they all had to follow that same procedure across the board with all of the people faculty instructional designers visuals visual folks programmers etc and making sure that our dashboards um you know displayed accurate information for Broward as our client so that's great if I if I could add there really quickly, um, LearningMate made this data available to our entire hierarchy of leadership and the leadership looked at it in near real time. Uh, it went a long way in developing uh, credibility for this immense investment in this learning program uh, using taxpayer dollars. Um, and it, if it were to have ever been that we could not identify where the cars were at any one time, where the courses were. I think we would have lost uh, a lot of credibility with our senior leadership, but in every case, we were able to respond to the request for <laughs> uh, the request for information. So uh, kudos to LearningMate for that uh, immense tracking of data. Thanks, Frank. All right, so Kate, Kate's gonna do our summary slide and then we can move into any other questions. Sure. I mean, these these are just some key points to keep in mind as we move into discussion. Um, I'll give you a minute to, to read these for yourselves. I'm curious, um, you know, we, we've gone through, we've, we've taken you through a sort of a, a very fast tour of this journey. Um, I'm curious what questions you might have and, and what challenges you all might be facing now or what projects might be on the horizon. And I think, um, you know, obviously this was a lot of courses, um, but I think it's a working model that serves for uh, other, um, any sort of programs at, at any size. So I think you can sort of extrapolate here and I hope that we've given you some some useful ideas here to, to be able to um, get, get a view of, of how you might tackle a project like this of your own and plan a journey like this. And I think really it is in the planning, it's in the planning, it's figuring out what you're gonna measure along the way and really um, building collaborative communication so that you know with a partner as great as Broward with such a strong mission, uh, we were really, really fortunate to be able to support your efforts um, and just to be a part of something that really we, we all know is, is making an impact on learners, which is why we're all here. So it was very, um, very exciting stuff. Um, all right, yes. 
how many hours approximately would the faculty have spent during this project? Um, uh, all right, so um, I we, think um, you did calculate we, that, didn't you, Nick? We, we well, we you know we we sat down with Frank and the leadership, and we we looked. It was a memorandum of understanding, so you know part of it was um, contractual. Um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, when faculty work on their own you know, for the course of, you know, building a course and uh, over the summer or in four and six months, they had about, you know, I think about 120 hours allotted to do the work. Um, and then we said, okay, we're going to give them a good instructional designer. So we try to cut that in half. Um, so over the course of um, those 40 uh, uh, business, those 40 business days, um, of eight sessions, we were looking uh, uh, for, you know, anywhere from, you know, five to eight hours a week per faculty. And then part of the reason we emphasize small changes was helping them make really good strategic decisions so they could do things that were achievable in the, in the time span and have, have great impact. Um, so we really were focusing on making it work under the conditions of an active community college five, five load semester. Hey, Nick, um, uh, there's a couple different questions in the chat about sessions and the 50-day schedule. So um, maybe you could just break it down. I'm, I was just looking at slide 13, but I think it may be too tiny, but maybe it's worth trying to pull that back up again. If we could, Megan, um, I'll tell you where to stop if the, if the numbers aren't just so, there we go. Oop, sorry, one, go ahead one, please, right there. Um, so the, the 50 days is sort of the, um, was to do with the calendar, 40 days of which were for uh, the interactions and then 10 days was for the build work that was and the um, quality checking review. Uh, and then the sessions, perhaps you can talk about the sessions, which were uh, sort of a way that the faculty together with the instructional designers plan their goals for throughout the course of the courses they were developing together. Yeah, it's important to remember that 200 of the courses were revisions to online courses that Broward had already online had approved and 100 were migrating from face-to-face -face courses. So some of them had online shells, but they were becoming official online courses for the first time. So the there were eight sessions of five business days each and this example calendar, days in yellow, um, faculty were contractually off for spring break. They had a faculty professional development day. So they were not consecutive calendar days. That, that's why you see them in green. We, then the, for the first week was to get started on the course map, um, help faculty. And a lot of faculty hadn't done course maps before. So something as simple as using a, a time on task calculator was new. Um, that was fun because then faculty start thinking like um, undergraduate students again. Um, but getting the course map done by the end of the second week, having the course map finished and having uh, whatever their interactive plan is. Are they going to do five articulates or two articulates and two other things inside of D2L? Then at the end of the third week, um, having that um, to-do list and the schedule of how they're going to apportion the work uh, laid out. And then using the remaining uh, five, five and a half sessions to complete the work. Um, and the, you don't see it too well in the screenshot necessarily, but the, the smart sheet was, was measured in sessions. So each session had a section. Each faculty member would set individual uh, goals with the instructional designer about the, what they were going to get done that week. Um, so that, that, was, that was the gist of it. Um, of course, design was was always happening in the background. If the because if the faculty were working on something that was already in D two L, such as a discussion prompt, and they were improving them, um, they might work out the improvement in a in a word doc to get the proof of concept. But then once that was done, um, there was a producer who was putting that in. We weren't waiting until the end of the forty days to do that work. So we were using a, a fast track model. Um, in, you see it in construction for, for tall buildings. Um, they lay the foundation and as the girders are going up on the top floors, on the bottom floors, they're putting in the wall, the electricity and everything else. And as they're finishing off the top, they're renting the bottom apartments. 
So we were building the courses as things were becoming ready uh, to make that 50 days work. Yeah, I can answer part of, of Tina's question around budget. Um, prior to this project, uh, we had run our instructional design and development much differently where faculty had much greater independence. But as we looked at those key facets for the project, the universal design for learning, the physical accessibility, uh, the shift towards student-centeredness and authenticity, we knew that we needed to bring in some assistance to help with that. Um, in order to ensure that the, this project was equitable for faculty in doing the work, we maintained the same level of compensation that faculty would have received had they been able to do the work separately apart from this project. Um, I should provide guidance that if you're gonna do a project like this with your faculty, um, that will be leveraged at scale across multiple sections. We uh, are, are very large institutions, so these sections are used with great numbers of students, that you not only uh, hire the primary subject matter expert who will design the course with uh, the instructional designer, but also potentially a faculty reviewer or two who can validate the representation of the body of knowledge, ensure that uh, biases have been uh, minimized, et cetera but also be sure that you bake into the cost models for the faculty side of the project, uh, the, the fringe benefits that normally would be assigned. Um, that was an early gotcha that we were able to work out. Um, it didn't negatively impact overall our project scope, but it is something that, that was a hiccup and something that we'd wanna consider. Uh, and again, if anybody would want to uh, further discuss this, I'm sure that our colleagues at Learning Mate would be uh, helpful for that. And I'd be very, uh, uh, please to help answer any questions that I can. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, so the, I, I can answer this uh, last question too. Um, we did this analysis in preparation for budgeting and we approximated our portfolio of courses at 2.96 credits on average. So we had labs, we had other uh, course lengths, but we very closely hit that three credit mark. Um, and so the, we did calculate with uh, learning mate seat time or what we called time in class, tick and time out of class talk based on the Carnegie model. We are a SACS institution. So uh, SACS has promulgated the federal regulations regarding clock hours to uh, credit hours. And so for a standard three credit course over our standard 15 week term, it turns out to be about 135 total hours. Fortunately for us, because we have since started to mature our remote learning into a formalized version of synchronous learning, we have the time in class calculations. We're using the curriculum maps to derive the synchronous versions of, of the courses. So it is uh, highly fortuitous that we did separate the time in class from the time out of class because it makes that parsing effort for the synchronous courses much easier. Great, I mean, I wouldn't really be doing my job if I didn't draw people's attention to Wendy Henwell's <laughs> kind endorsement of us as well. Um, it's, great to, it's great to see a friendly name on a screen. I can't see anyone's face, but, but it's great to see Wendy, Wendy here today too. And, um, I'm sure she could she could tell you some stuff about learning man if you if you were interested as well. But um, really really appreciate everyone's time today. I you know I watching the chat. It looks like that's about all that's coming. Oh wait no hang on ah oh there we go. <laughs> um, thanks Wendy. Um, it looks like that's about that's about it. We I know we have a few more minutes and I know you know everybody would hate to wind up the session a few minutes early given that it's the end of the day, but. Would love to, um, our, our contact information's on the screen. Um, if you can't tell, we, we just love this stuff. We, we love collaborating. We're all in this to, um, you know, further education and, and to improve learner experiences. So happy to share what we know. Um, happy to connect on any specifics or anything in general. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And, and thank you all so much for your time and attention today. I know you're all busy. I know you had other 
choices you could have made. And it was really awesome that you chose to spend your afternoon with us. Great, thank you so much, everybody. And if you do have questions after this, you can post them into the chat and I'll make sure that our speakers get them. And a survey should be coming up very shortly. So make sure to provide your feedback on the session. And it was recorded, it will be embedded in the session. You can access that later this week. So thank you again to our speakers and thank you for being part of the session. Have a good day.